This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course on schemes and will be about coherent sheaves on projective space. Um, so the basic original reference for coherent sheaves on projective space is Sayer's very famous paper on um, algebraic coherent sheaves. And quite frankly, you should really read that paper rather than wasting your time watching YouTube videos if you want to learn algebraic geometry. So we recall last time that we had a correspondence graded modules M over the polynomial ring with um, quasi-coherent sheaves Um, she's F over PR. And if you've got a module M, we saw how to take a quasi-coherent sheaf M twiddle. And if you've got a quasi-coherent sheaf F, then we saw we could go to gamma star of F, which was just sum over gamma of Fn. And these correspondences don't give an equivalence of categories. In particular, if you start with a graded module M and then you take the corresponding sheaf and then you do take gamma star of M twiddle, this need not be, be isomorphic to M. So if M, for instance, is a finite dimensional vector space, then this module here is just zero, so you can't recover M from it. However, it's still pretty close to being an equivalence of categories. Um, roughly speaking, coherent sheaves can be sort of thought of as roughly the same as graded mod as finitely generated graded modules. except you sort of ignore the modules of finite length. So this roughly means ones that are finite dimensional over the vector space K. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of see this a bit later, this lecture. Um, so um, what we want to show is um, that if we start with a sheaf and then take the corresponding graded module and then take a sheaf corresponding to it. This is isomorphic to F, at least if F is coherent. Um, should remark in the other direction, um, um, Although M isn't isomorphic to gamma star of N, we do get a natural map from M to gamma star of M twiddle, unless, it's, unless the map is the other way around. It's very difficult to remember. Um, this map from M to, to this space here is, is neither injective nor surjective in general. Um, the cor the um, the relation between M and M trail is a little bit subtle. Okay, anyway, now we want to show that F, if we take any coherent sheaf, turn it into a graded module, and then turn it back into a sheaf, we more or less get the sheaf we first thought of. So we recall that PR is covered by open sets um, of the form dxi, which you can think of as being xi non-zero, uh, somewhat informally. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that f is isomorphic to gamma star of f twiddles on each dxi. And this will be enough because if we show these two things are isomorphic and on, on a um, if, if we find an isomorphism between these on each dxi, then that would be enough to show that they're isomorphic. Um, we, we have to, of course, it's not enough to show that these are isomorphic on each dxi. We have to show that all these isomorphisms are compatible with each other, um, which I will 
sort of skip because it's kind of obvious the isomorphisms we write will be compatible. So let's have a look. On dxi, we need to work out what the restriction of this is. And if you unravel these definitions, you find um, what you have to do is you take global sections of gamma n, then you can take global sections of, sorry, not f of n, global sections of f of n plus one, and you can get from, the, the, there's a map from these where you multiply by xi, and multiply by xi again and go to gamma of f of n plus two, and so on. And we can take a direct limit of these. Um, so we take the limit over all n of global sections of f n. This isn't quite the union because these maps aren't injective. If, if these maps were injective, then, the, 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 then this would be the union. Um, and we want to compare this with f of uh, d x i. So we're, we're restricting all we're restricting all these. Um, so, so we have maps going like this, and this induces a map going like that. And we want to show this is an isomorphism. Um, and um, these maps here are neither injective nor surjective in general. It's, it's only when you sort of take a limit that they become an isomorphism. So we have to show that, that this map is injective. Objective. And we prove these by sort of just um, working through the definitions and taking a look. So, so let's show that gamma of, so, so the direct limit of the gamma Fn to Fdxi is injective. So to do this, let's pick S in um, some gamma of Fn. And suppose S has image naught in Fdxi. So the picture is, you know, we've got sort of dx1 dx2, dx3, and so on. And we're picking some global section, and it's zero on one of these. This doesn't imply S is zero, because, for example, the sheaf F might have support um, that, that, that doesn't meet, say, dx1, and then the, the, there will be global sections of it which are actually zero on dx1. Um, well... Um, if f has image zero in dxi, then it has image zero in dxi intersection dxj. And this means that um, xi to the sum power times s is equal to zero in dxj. Um, so, um, so s is killed by some power of xi in dxj. And there are only a finite number of dxj's. So s is killed by some power of, of xi on p to the r. And um, this means that S is naught in the direct limit of, of the gamma Fn. So the map is injective. Um, next, we want to show that the map from the limit of global sections of Fn to, um, um, to F of dxi is onto. And so what we do is we pick some S in F of dxi. So if you go back to our picture, we've got dxi, dxj, dxk, and so on. And now 
we can extend f We can extend f to dxj if we multiply by some power of xi, because um, we know that s is defined on the intersections of these, and dxj is sort of got by localized. I mean, we, we get the functions on this intersection by localizing functions on dxj at xi, which means we can we can extend any function on this intersection to the whole thing by multiplying by a high power of xi. So we can extend it to dxj. We have an extension like this. And we can also extend to dxk. So we have another extension of it like this. The problem is... The extensions might not be the same on dxj intersection dxk. So what do we do about this? Well, we notice that um, if we take these two extensions, they're at least equal on this region here. And that means that they're equal on this region here, provided you multiply them by a suitable power of x of x um, of x i. They become equal if multiplied by a power of x i. Um, actually, there's a bit of a subtlety going on here. We're sort of implicitly assuming that this. Um, intersection is affine. Um, the argument still goes through if this intersection is a finite union of affines. I mean, it's always affine for projective space, but in general, um, when you generalize this argument, you need this intersection to be a finite union of affine spaces. And this is, th th in general, this sort of condition is true if the space you're talking about is quasi separated. And um, you remember the quasi separated property has this nice phenomenon that it ensures intersections of affine spaces are unions of finite number of affines. Anyway, if we work on projective space, we can, we can ignore that technical complication. Um, so um, if you put all this together, you see if you multiply s by a sufficiently high power of xi, then you can extend it to a, a global section of the whole space. And, th and that says that it's the image of one of these if, if you twist by n enough. So that more or less shows that, um, that, that, that the map from, um, it, that, that if you start with a sheaf, then it's isomorphic to gamma star um, of F twiddle. So, um, so all quasi-coherent sheaves come from graded modules. And this means you can transfer a lot of facts about, quasi, about graded modules to quasi-coherent sheaves. For example, every um, coherent sheaf is a quotient of a finite sum of line bundles of the form O-N. And this is because every finitely generated module is a quotient of um, shifts of free modules. Um, uh, actually, I guess we're using a few facts about coherent sheaves that we haven't quite proved yet. Um, so we're, we're sort of cheating a bit and um, assuming that global sections of coherent sheaves of finite dimension. We'll be, we'll be proving that a little bit later. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so, um, in fact, we can get a resolution um, if we take a um, a sheaf F, 
we can get a resolution by locally free sheaves. Um, F0 goes to F1, goes to F2, and so on, because the kernel of the map from F0 to F will also be a coherent sheaf, and we can keep on applying this. And Hilbert showed that, in fact, this resolution ends after a finite number of steps. So quasi-coherent sheaves all have finite resolutions by um, um, vector bundles. So, so all of these are sums of sheaves of the form O of n for various values of n. Um, um, next, um, any coherent sheaf is generated by global sections. In other words, it's generated by a finite number. Um, and what this means is if we've got a sheaf F and we pick any point P in Pn, then the, 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 then, then the stalk of F at P is generated Sorry, um, if we've got a coherent sheaf F, sorry, I should have said F twisted by N is gener generated by a finite number of global sections for N sufficiently large. So what this means is if, if you take a point P in projective space then the stalk of Fn at P is generated by global sections. of F. And the proof is sort of similar to the proof that um, F is F of uh, gamma star of F twiddle, so I'm going to omit it. Um, we can also see that coherent sheaves are built out of, of special coherent sheaves of the form um, um, co corresponding to um, the ideal um, of some irreducible subset. So P is the ideal of an irreducible subset. And I also want to twist these by n. This follows from the fact that a finitely generated graded module has um, a filtration naught equals m naught contained in m1, so I'm contained in m k equals m, with each m i over m i minus one of the form. Um, k x1 0 to xr modulo some ideal again twisted by n. So this is the basic result of commutative algebra. For ungraded ideals it's a fairly standard result. Um, follows from the fact that any finitely generated module has, has an associated prime if it's non-zero which gives you the initial step and so on. And for graded modules the proof is very similar. So at first sight, this seems to make coherent sheaves easy to understand. They just correspond. You can build them by taking irreducible subsets of projective space and um, um, building them out of coherent sheaves that sort of um, have support on that irreducible set and are somehow look a bit like a one dimensional vector bundle on that set. Um, however, the problem with that is, first of all, um, in order to classify coherent sheaves, you need to understand every irreducible subset of projective space, which would mean understanding every possible variety, um, which is obviously an, ins an incredibly difficult problem. The other problem is the way these 
these modules fit together like this is also rather complicated. Just because you know all these quotients uh, gives you some information about M, but there can be enormous numbers of rather complicated way of fitting the quotients together. Um, so this gives us a sort of picture of the blocks you can build coherent sheaves out of, but this still doesn't give us a completely clear picture of what a coherent sheaf looks like. Um, so I'm going to finish by um, showing a basic result that says that if F is coherent on P to the N, then the global sections of F is finite dimensional over K. Um, so this, this, this works for projective space or more generally for projective varieties, but you remember it just fails totally for affine varieties. If you've got a coherence chief on an affine variety, it corresponds to a module over the coordinate ring, and there's absolutely no reason why that module should be a finite dimensional vector space over K. Um, and the proof of this in Hotshon uses some rather tricky um, commutative algebra that I can never remember. Um, what we're going to do is give a proof using cohomology. And the proof using cohomology is very easy and straightforward. And there's only one slight problem with it that we haven't actually covered cohomology yet. But, you know, I don't care. I'm going to give the proof using cohomology anyway. I mean, let's face it, if I had covered cohomology, it wouldn't make any difference because nobody ever bothers looking at the earlier videos. I mean, I've been checking YouTube and everybody watching this channel always starts by watching the latest video I've made as if it's time sensitive information. So whatever. We're going to give a cohomological proof, even though we haven't covered cohomology. So let's take a coherent sheaf. And by using some of the results we gave earlier, plus some of the results we didn't really give earlier, you can write F as a quotient of a finite sum of line bundles. Let's call this B. So this is going to be a sum of ONs. And there will be some kernel A, which is also coherent. Um, so th th this sort of implicitly uses that F is generated by a finite number of global sections and so on in order to get that there's a finite sum there. So um, what you can do is we know the global sections of ON. So you could try saying, well, we've got a map from the global sections of B to the global sections of F. Let's get my Fs and my gammas muddled up. And since this is finite dimensional and B maps onto F, therefore this is finite dimensional. Well, if you argue like that, you're a bozo who hasn't been paying attention because just because this sheaf maps onto, it doesn't mean the global sections map onto. I guess that should be a gamma. Um, so cohomology comes to the rescue because what we have here is we can extend this to an exact sequence H1 of A. So all we have to do is to prove that H1 of a coherent sheaf is finite dimensional, and then we're finished. Well, that's easy to do because if you've got an exact sequence of sheaves like this, then um, we have an exact sequence of cohomology groups. H1 of A goes to H1 of B goes to H1 of F. And we know this is finite dimensional um, because we can calculate the cohomology of sums of line bundles, and it always turns out to be finite dimensional. So this is um, the dimension is finite. And you're not going to fall into the trap of thinking this map is onto a gain. Um, and as you might guess, there's an obstruction, which is a second cohomology group of A. So we want to show the second cohomology group of any coherent sheaf is finite dimensional. And you see, we can repeat this. Second cohomology groups are finite dimensional, provided a third cohomology group is finite dimensional. And this sounds completely pointless. We seem to be in infinite regress, but we are saved by the following fact that H R plus one of any sheaf equals zero 
if r plus one is greater than the dimension of whatever variety we're working on, which is r dimensional projective space. And r plus one is greater than the dimension projective space, so all these sheaves vanish. So we can prove that the space of global sections of any coherent sheaf is finite by descending induction on um, cohomology groups, HI of a coherent sheaf. And it's rather, rather a funny proof because you tend to think of the zeroth and first dimension, the low dimensional cohomology groups as being the easy ones to work with. But here we're starting with the high dimensional cohomology groups and working downwards and ending up with the results about the zero dimensional cohomology groups. Anyway, I'll just finish by summarizing the results about cohomology groups that we use, just that if you would later do cohomology, we can check we've got them all. So the results about cohomology groups we used are, first of all, if we've got an exact sequence of sheaves, we get a long exact sequence of cohomology groups. and so on. Um, you probably get the idea by now. We just go on like this. The second fact is that H I of A equals naught if I is greater than the dimension of whatever variety we're working on. And the third one is that the dimension of the all cohomology group of um, any one of these line bundles is less than infinity. And this you have to prove by an explicit calculation, which was first done by Sayre. Um, okay, so I think that's quite enough about coherent sheaves. What we'll move on to next lecture is um, the Picard group, which is closely related to divisors and line bundles.